was the first seconds I can see myself, but I only see it later in the video. I just want to make 100% sure that I'm here. I think I see myself. So good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, United States and wherever else you are in the world. Welcome to the last fine of this year. My name is Carsten Schradin. I'm a um, director of research at the CNRS in Strasbourg, France. I'm one of the co-hosts and it's a great pleasure for me to host this last fine. And with this, I also want to um, take the opportunity to quickly look back at the fine that we had the, this um, season. It was really a lot of amazing talks and I don't want to um, um, highlight any of these talks. I just let this video play here at the back while I'm talking about it. We had talks about social insects, birds, um, um, mammals, of course, ants, and so on. And it was really amazing for us to see all these talks and to, that so many people come here together um, once a week to, to share our fascination about social evolution in um, so many dimensions. It was the third season that we did have the, the fine, and we are also amazed that we always can get so many um, high-class scientists to, to present here. And we are also very happy to announce that, of course, the fine will continue. In the email I sent around today, there was an, um, an overview of the preliminary program of the fine. We nearly have all the speakers together. There's still one open slot. We are at the moment busy fill, filling up. And there are some titles and some photos missing, but all in all, um, we have the program together for next year, which you can also see on our on our homepage. And again, we have, from my opinion, of course, an amazing list of, of speakers and from all over the world working on um, these uh, many different um, aspects of social evolution, like we. Um, like we did in, in the last uh, um, seminars. If, if you know of anybody who you think should really present at the fine, you can send us an email and we put this person on the list. But I'm happy to say we still have a long list of people we would like to invite. And when I'm saying I'm happy about this, it, because for me it means our field is still flourishing, the fine can still continue for many years. And for us, it's always difficult to make a choice who to invite. We try to have a diversity of people working on the different taxa coming from different countries, working in different environments. And um, so I also know there's many very regular um, people in the fine audience that sh should all be invited at some stage. And I can assure you, we will invite you. And if it's not uh, next year, then, then maybe the year afterwards. So this is all still um, coming. And, and one um, aspect of the fine we also would like to to emphasize and promote is not only the very old established um, researchers, which um, everybody already does know, but also for the future of our field to highlight what we call rising stars. And we try to have at least two rising stars. In every fine rising stars are from the perspective of Europe, young researchers that do not have a permanent position yet. And from the perspective of the United States, where it's a bit different, um, uh, young researchers that might not be at the too high um, ranking institutions yet and might still rise to, to a better um, university. And so for me today, it's a great pleasure to introduce one of these rising stars, Valeria Romano, who is originally from Brazil and is going to talk about information and pathogen transmission in animal societies. I met Valeria when I came as a permanent researcher after struggling um, for more than when I was already 40 years old before I got a permanent position at the CNRS. And she was there a PhD student. She, like I said, comes originally from Brazil and she did her master's there working on the golden lion tamarind. But then she got um, a grant from the um, Brazilian Ministry of Education to come as a PhD student to France. And I have to say that from the beginning, I saw that um, Valeria is full of power, is totally motivated to work about science and it's really her passion and that she's doing this in the way it should be done, in the way to find answers to the interesting questions she's asking in the most um, appropriate and reliable way. And, uh, and I was from the beginning impressed by her and then also saw how she's developing during her career, how she has been publishing and improving, um, for example, the quality of the journals in which she has been publishing. So the entire trajectory 
And this is why I think um, the title of a rising star to her applies um, quite well. She published uh, quite a number of papers, including in high ranking journals like Trends in Ecology and Evolution in Biological Refuse in uh, the Philosophical Transactions and so on. And her PhD, which is what she will be mainly talking about today, was about pathogen transmission in social networks in um, Japanese macaques. And after a PhD, which she finished in 2017, she was doing um, several postdocs. Her first postdoc was the one in, in Kyoto at a primate research institute. Like I said, she had worked with Japanese macaques during her PhD. Then she did a short postdoc in Spain. Now she then used her methods of network analysis and she will um, shortly talk about it at the end of the talk, how these networks that arise from studies in animal behavior can also be used for um, human cultures, for prehistoric human cultures. She did a third postdoc again in Spain, which at the moment she's finishing at, she's at the um, Institute of Research of Archaeology and Heritage in Alicante. And um, next month in January, she's starting her fourth postdoc, also showing you how demanding and difficult it is um, in the academic system, especially in Europe. And she comes back to, to France, to Marseille, to the ERD, the Institute of Research for the Development. It's a, it's a specific um, research institution in France, established already in 1937 with more than 2000 staff. And the aim of this institute, the ERD, is to bring knowledge of researchers into other countries that are, um, let's say, less rich. So it's the aim here is to have a transfer of knowledge by these researchers going back to other countries. And um, Malaria will spend several months a year for this um, um, in Brazil and working there with local communities. Um, I think it's something very in important. The focus here is less on doing as much research as possible, but bringing something really to the local communities, which these communities um, do need. So, and like I said, um, Valeria, we mainly talk about her work on pathogen transmissions in, I guess, suppose primates, but at the end, she will also shortly introduce how these methods might be used to come to a better understanding of um, prehistoric um, human cultures and how they were connected with each other. So with this, I'm handing over to Valeria, and I'm very, very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Carsten. Well, um, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Final Seminars for this invitation. I feel truly honored to join the panel of speakers. And today, as Carsten said, I'm going to talk about social transmissions in animal societies. I will first guide this presentation to the trade-off between information and pathogen transmissions. And then I'm going to look at the, some perspectives, these broad perspectives into this concept. Well, to start, I would like to remember that establishing social connections is not always easy. It depends on multiple factors, and we know that our decisions and our behavior influence our social relationships. It can be, for example, that the longer time we spend with some colleagues, the higher will be the probability of reinforcing social relationships or not. So these challenges of creating and maintaining social relationships, they can also be observed in a vast range of species. The relationships animals form depend on social hierarchy, on seasonality, on the distributions of resources, among others. So the question is, how do individuals manage their social relationships under so many environmental and social pressures? We can study these questions by using an approach that Hind developed in 1976, which he proposed that individuals' behavior is scale up in this shape, in, sorry, it scales up to shape this complex patterns of social structure. So basically in this framework, individuals through their characteristics and behaviors, they influence the patterns of social interactions and relationships that in their totality affects the social structure, right? So this global point. This scheme does not include any causal directionality. So this means that the influence may circle back to influence the social relationships and individual behavior, creating what we call a feedback loop and the potential for shifting these fitness landscapes of society. So if you want to transform or to convert this into network parlance, we can say that these individuals can be represented by nodes, their interactions or their social relationships by the ads connecting these nodes, 
And then this social structure could be represented by social networks or the network topology per se. In each one of these layers, we have multiple environmental and social pressures that affect how individuals behave and how the social structure is formed, such as predation, competitions for resources, access to social information, and pathogen expositions. For these two factors specifically, so information and pathogens, they are embedded into this broader concept of social transmission, which in simple words means um, any entity that can be transmitted from one individual to another. That means that they are socially acquired by either direct contact or proximity. If we think of information transmissions that are a few or actually there are a lot of examples for information. It can be alarm call, it can be the information about an infrared in place of work to making. An interesting example comes from a study from Lou Saplin and colleagues that in 2012 showed that the order of arrival at new forage impacts was predicted by the number of associations in three sympathetic species of tidies. So here in this graph, you can observe that the discovery of the patch was actually correlated with the number of social complex individuals has. So on the other hand, infectious agent transmissions encompasses endoparasites, ectoparasites, respiratory virus that are also socially acquired. And here we have an example of Kimberly Van Duvall and colleagues that show that the contact between species actually favor E. coli transmissions. So species sharing the same space, they actually had a higher interspecific association was again positively related with the probability of sharing subtypes of E. coli. So information and pathogen transmissions that are socially acquired, they do affect individual fitness. And then the final example to exemplify that to you is that um, uh, females, hunter-gatherers in the Philippines, females of the hunter-gatherers in the Philippines, they, they or in these central positions in the group, they have a higher, higher reproductive success, but they also were exposed for respiratory disease. So they have higher expositions for disease. So there is plenty of evidence actually demonstrating that both information and pathogen transmissions depend on social connectivity. In simple words, the stronger the social connections or the more connections the individual already has with an informant or with an infected individual, the higher will be this probability of information and pathogen transmissions. But these factors have been traditionally studied separately. And although substantially research have considered the effect of information transmissions on this interface, very little is known about the effect of pathogens and much less on the combined effect of information and pathogen transmissions in these multiple scales of interactions. So what we propose is to extend this Heinz classical framework to look at this feedback loop between individual behavior, social structure, and social transmission, considering both beneficial and detrimental forces. Here, instead of considering transmissions as the end point, or assuming that information flow is the only relevant variable, we suggest a simultaneous examinations of information and pathogen transmissions as explicitly and opposing forces that mediate social decisions, and then the emergent social structure then under them. So if we look at this scheme with a little bit more of details, let's suppose we're gonna have both information pathogen transmissions in the, into this system. So individuals, we may expect that individuals, they would try to interact with those that provide some benefits for them. So they're gonna go look for interactions with those that are informed. So increasing their type of strength, increasing the, the, the relationship they have with these informed individuals. On the other way around, if uh, this is individual get infected or have clear signs of infection, they're going to expect that the individuals would avoid interacting with them, and consequently, the relationship is going to get weaker. So this change in individual status would influence the social relationships, and this change in social relationships would lead to structural change at the network level. Here, an example is that this, if you have a dense network, so these would favor information transmissions, but in the case of a, a subdivided network, so with a weak links between individuals, we're gonna have a limited pathogen transmissions. Of course, this is a much more complex approach. It depends on the kind of uh, contagion we're looking at. So for example, on simple contagion, simply consider the number and strength of relationships 
while a complex contagion is we take into account the proportion of social connections to informed and infected individuals. And all of these, all this dynamic and feedback loop is going to feedback the other layers, where, for example, information and culture and pathogen acquisitions, you change individual stats and then this you go back again. And the network topology, you finally mediate information and pathogen transmission. So in a situation like that, we can expect that if information is lower, but pathogen is higher, then survival should decrease or the other way around. So the question then is, can we detect this kind of social transmission trade off or how can we do it? Well, variation in individual behavior can be detected throughout the social network analysis and therefore by estimating what we call network properties. In this way, we can look at the resulting variations at different levels. For example, we can investigate the influence of individuals in the whole transmission process or at the fact of the whole social structure on information and pathogen transmission. So to exemplify, we are going to travel to Japan, specifically to the island of Koshima in the south of Japan, where together with a great team of researchers, I spent about eight months collecting behavior data of Japanese macaques. In this stage, I was, uh, we were interested in the social interactions among individuals to understand the role of central individuals or the role of individuals in the chain of social transmission. So the first level of this framework. Here we approach these questions in different ways. We collect data on actual and band of scientists. We also perform some information transmissions experiments. But because I am interested in the dynamics of information or pathogen transmission today, I'm going to show these results of simulated social transmission. And here, the first thing um, we do into this kind of a framework is to collect the behavior data. So we collect the data on the direct contact, on proximity, and we convert these into a connectivity matrix where individuals, they are represented from A to E. And in this case, we have a binary connectivity matrix where we simply say whether individuals they are connected or not to others. We convert these into a network that is later used into a input it into an individual based model where we can simply look at the actions and interactions of autonomous agents. And in our case, since we're interested in into a social diffusion process, I used a network based SI epidemiological model. So this is similar to the susceptible infected epidemiological model where simply individuals, they move from one category to another. So either they are informed or they are, they are, they are naive or they are susceptible or they are infected and they are informed. Individuals, they cannot come back to the previous stages they were and the probability of a first infection is a stochastic. So they can get informed or infected at random. Then what we included in new here is that the transmission or the probability of transmissions or acquisition here of infections agents depend on the contact with already infected group members. So we included a component of the social networks in this time. And our results were actually very much uh, straightforward. What we observed it was a linear and a strong relationship between individual social connectivity and social transmission. In this case, we can observe in both graphs that those individuals with more and strong social relationships, they transmitted information and pathogen to a higher number of group members. But interestingly, if you look at the graphs, the percentage of infected individuals in Koshima was much higher than the percentage of infected individuals in Yakushima. So this goes me into the questions on whether there were other properties of the network that actually could influence the process of social transmissions. So when you look at both networks of these islands of Koshima and Yakushima, you can observe that actually, although they look similar, they were actually very much different. The network of Yakushima were, were much more subdivided than the network found in Koshima. And this is represented by a network of property called modularity. So we started diving into the literature and we discovered that a group of researchers proposed that among the distinct network properties, modularity had a key role on social transmissions. And in simple terms, modularity means how subdivided is the network or how many models a network has. So for us working with mammals, this basically represents subgroups or communities. 
And within this theoretical framework, what these researchers found, Charles Noah and colleagues, they demonstrated that actually this increased the modularity worked as a functional barrier to social transmissions, supporting the so-called the social bottleneck hypothesis. Here we have this hypothesis predicts that largest groups would be more subdivided and therefore they would break, they would slow down transmissions process. And what this they found was actually very much clear. All the groups that had no subgroups, basically, so there is no values of modularity, modularity was very low, they had a much more a higher rate of impact individuals than those found with a lot of subgroups. So we had evidence that modularity could downregulate social transmissions, but at the same time, a few other studies show us that this could be much more dynamic. So we asked the questions, to what degree network efficiency, a measure of social transmissions, would be modularity dependent? So we chose to test these using uh, global efficiency, which is a proxy for social transmissions, and it simply represents how quickly information on pathogen is transmitted from the spreader to the most peripheral individual in the group. Then we created about 2,800 theoretical networks with varying group size and network properties. Here we can see that we controlled by the group size and also by density to explore a broad combination of network properties varying from low to high values of modularity and therefore to investigate this relationship between network efficiency and modularity. We also gather published information on the network metrics of 41 primate species from primate groups from 15 species. So here we have data that uh, our group, our research team has already calculated, for example, from Japanese macaques and all the collaborators we have from other species on global efficiency and modularity. So we could perform the same analysis with empirical data. And what we observed was a non-linear relationship between global efficiency and the modularity. Our results they suggest is that two distinct roles in mediating transmissions process. So here we can observe that these low values of modularity increase network efficiency, while these high values of modularity led to a decrease in network efficiency. And interestingly, this pattern was also observed in real world comments, suggesting that intermediate values of modularity produces the highest efficiency although at higher absolute values. So these results have some implications for understanding network plasticity. Here I mean the changes in the social network topology through the reorganizations of individual social relationships. And that's actually something that we all experienced percentually. We ourselves, as we increased our levels of, of isolations of groups, subdivision like as an effort to break COVID-19 transmissions, and in other animals, actually, this also happens. So a few months after we published this theoretical, this theoretical finding in empirical, with empirical support, there was this amazing group of researchers from Switzerland that they published this, this work showing that actually uh, black ants, they changed the social interactions when they were exposed to a given fungus. And these reinforced transmissions inhibitory characteristics in the contact network. So what you can observe in this figure is that um, before the treatment, the colony had a specific network. And soon after the treatment, where some individuals, some foragers, they were exposed to the fungus, this becomes, the knuckle network become much more modular, much more subdivided than previously. And that can be observed here by the network properties and consequently on the efficiency of transmissions in these networks. So, we could observe that animals, they modulate their behavior dynamically in ways that increase the benefits and reduce the costs of social interactions. And this should lead to these detectable changes in the social networks. But then the question is to remains, how individuals would behave when despite the risk of infection, there remains a need to acquire social information. So we can make some predictions. Well, if we consider, for example, in a system where we have high values of information and low values of pathogens, as you can see in the figure part A, we may expect that these informed individuals, they will be preferred social patterns, and the changes in network will become 
toward a more centralized network, right? So if you have one or two individuals that has high values information, or they are the only one in commons, they will be the preferred partners. In the meantime, if there is no pathogen, we would not detect and change the social behavior. In the part view of this figure, what you can predict is that if there are low values of information in the system, there are high values of pathogen in the system, we might expect that in fact individuals will be socially avoided. So this change will be towards a more subdivided network since there are no information. So information doesn't play any role and there is no detectable change in social behavior. But then, if there are intermediate values of information and pathogen transmissions in the system, this can be a little bit more complicated. So the lower we may expect to have a low network subdivision, but a variety of density, because these individuals will try to change the, their, their interactions all the time to get information and move. So this is going to be a little bit more sarcastic. And perhaps it's here that you're going to see much more variability in the social interactions, a term that we have previously introduced as adaptive networks. And here say the term with the careful, just in the sense that these networks and these interactions can change. Of course, then, that when we move to a system where perhaps there are high values of information, high values of pathogens, then here we're going to expect a multiple to come, such as individuals relying on their own personal information, on leading to group fissioning, or that uh, classical example of we observe from four and try to get information needed. So then the thing is, is we try to answer this question and trying to taste test these predictions by creating a multi-agent based model where individuals they choose with whom and how frequently to interact among a set of individuals that might be informed or infected or both to varying degrees. So here we created 20 conditions where values of information and pathogens vary systematically. You can observe, for example, that if there are some conditions where information they don't exist in the system, others where they are context, uh, sorry, compost, and others where they vary linearly in the system or exponentially. And how this model works. So basically, we have some rules of interactions where these individuals, they are endowed with values of information from zero to one and pathogens. And then an individual is activated at first at random. But after that, the possible, there is a possible result of an interactions where individuals can perceive information, they can perceive pathogens, or they perceive information and pathogen, or they don't perceive anything. Based on their experience, they decide with which one with other partners to interact. And here they will take the decisions based on their, on their experience. So they will try to interact with those that have a higher value of information, shared potential, and they'll try to avoid those individuals with uh, a pathogen spreading potential. And then we ask the questions which networks emerge from these interactions. If we take, for example, let's say an extreme condition, we may expect the following. In a conditions where a few individuals have a lot of information and there is no pathogen in the system, we may expect that most of the other individuals in this network or in this group, they will try to interact only with those that are informed. So we expect a high centralized, a low density, and a low modular network. And then that's is exactly the result we found. Here we can observe the kind of network we talked about. So this is our star network. And since individual one, they have the highest values of information, most of the individuals, all individuals of the group actually, they try to interact with this one, having them a network that it has very low of modularity, very low density, but high centralized. Now let's try to increase a bit the complexity, okay? So if we look at the results now of the conditions where there are only infected individuals in the systems, we may expect them to be avoided, right? So this leads to variations in the network centralizations with some very high centralized networks emerging when the cost of interactions are linear distributed across individuals in the group. So let's look them at them with a little bit more careful. In the case, for example, there is no information in the system, only pathogens, and these levels of pathogens are homogeneously distributed across individuals. Well, these interactions are going to be much more stochastic because it doesn't matter with which one they interact, they will always have the same cost. So centralization doesn't matter, they will connect with anybody. But then when they have a few individuals with a high value of, uh, of pathogens and a low values of pathogens, then we expect a high centralized network 
because, of course, individuals will try to interact with those that provide the least of the costs. When the pathogen is distributed across individuals and individuals in an exponential way, then it will be served with a less centralized network because, of course, again, they have much more individuals to interact with since there are a lot and there are many, a few of them that actually has no, um, no pathogens. Now, if we take the conditions where both information and pathogens are present in the system, then these become much more complex to understand. So we decide to tackle this complexity by estimating the combined distribution of information and pathogen in the system through gene indexes, which is a statistical measure of distribution and which has been originally created to look at the inequality of income distribution. So what we do is that to, we calculate the Gini coefficients using values of my information and pathogen to each conditions on the study. And then we calculate in a global index where we simply subtract the Gini information from the Gini pathogens and we have a global index varying from minus one to one. So here basically what this means. When our global index have values closer to minus one, this means that few individuals in multiple monopolize high values of pathogens, while information were more equally distributed among individuals. And while this value was close to one, then it's meant that few individuals monopolize high values of information, while pathogen was more equally distributed among individuals. And that's our results. We could have solved a relationship between group size, global index, and modularity. And the global index was negatively correlated with modularity. Let's try to look at them with a bit more details. So what happens? We had a more modular networks when few individuals have the highest values of pathogen and information was more equally distributed among several individuals, so the local, low global indexes. On the other way around, we had less modular networks when few individuals have the highest values of information and the pathogen was more equally distributed among several individuals, therefore the highest global indexes. So what does this mean? This means that interactive action of pathogen information in the system can drive modular social networks. And these networks emerge when there is a kind of balance between costs and benefits, either to avoid highly infected individuals or less informed individuals. In my opinion, I think this is interesting because these results can also help us to shed light on this poorly investigated trade-off. But then the other question is, can we do this empirically? So together with three researchers from the University of Edinburgh, we started developing a protocol to look at the influence of both information and pathogen transmissions in fruit flies. We already know that information transmissions happens from studies of other researchers and collaborators of ours. But what was still missing was to identify whether pathogens drive variations in social aggregations and whether this aggregation mediates pathogen transmissions in Drosophila. So we investigated how the behavioral response to bacterial infection in Drosophila is modified by pathogen and host factors, and we established a systemic infection with one of four bacterial pathogens, bacterial pathogens with well-described pathology in fruit flies. So in each day of the experiments, individuals they were infected with one of those four bacterial species. We infected flies for them marked with a pink powder in the abdomen, and we respected giving recovery time, and then we included them in what we call the social interaction camera. Here in the social interaction cameras, we took pictures of 30 minutes for about uh, four hours of observations, and then we used data, these data to estimate levels of social aggregation by computing the Euclidean distance between all pairs of points. Then we classified this behavioral and um, distance data into categories of infected with infected, susceptible with susceptible, and susceptible and infected. And our main results, they are threefold. The first, this shows that the distance with infected females decreases throughout the time. So infected flies, they aggregated. When you observe here against the control, right, the control in black and the, in the other colors, our different pathogens, we can observe that in general, the aggregations between the infected groups were actually lower than the control groups, and this tend to decrease throughout time. But this seems to be sex specific, as females they aggregate much more than actually than males. 
And finally, in our experiments, yeah. And finally, in our experiments, it seems that social variation was not related to infection transmissions, but to factors such as sex and genetic background seems actually much more important. So for testing this empirically, we still need to get more input into this uh, protocol, and we hope to have this um, done in the near future. So that is a social transmission trade-off that is fully investigated, which we believe is a new avenue for research in behavior ecology. It is certainly a challenge to target. I showed to you a few results already on the theoretical experiment and also on the way to perform some empirical studies. But to finish in, to start finishing this talk, we're going to start looking at, um, and, I mean, and we hope, right, to have more discussions about that. But then to start looking at, the, to close this talk and start looking more at the general topic of social transmissions and society, I think here is important to look at the three axes of the studies on how environmental and social factors affect social transmissions. So, so far, I talked a, a lot about social factors and how this is related to social transmissions. But then a question is, what about expanding this approach to other disciplines or looking at the influence of environmental factors? So these are the two other perspectives I would like to quickly show to you. First, what I did uh, was to cross disciplinary boundaries and uh, together with archaeologists as a network scientist um, from the ERC project called the Paleodem in Spain, we started to investigate whether social networks could have an influence on the transmissions of technological tools in the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer societies. What we know, for example, is that in just in a short time window, these two called trapeze-based industries, they spread throughout the whole Iberian Peninsula. But, uh, there is still very few, actually, I could say that are no studies yet on whether social networks influence or how the social connectivity at this time influence the transmissions of tools in the prehistory. So what do you do? We first collect uh, data. This is uh, a team work, right? So first the team collect an amazing amount of data describing the psychological scientists, the context, the occurrence of these trapezes. And then we reconstruct these prehistoric networks using ontological sciences as our nodes and the traveling distance as our estimators of the links. Certainly, there are some challenges in reconstructing archaeological networks, such as a network may be incomplete. Then, what we do is performing some robustness tests to make sure that the network metrics we are estimating are actually representative of the, let's say, the regional and the complete network. So, after we perform a few tests, we apply a social diffusion model in which we include these networks, so very similar to what I just showed to you for employments. And then we try to understand whether the patterns observed in our simulations and therefore the influence of social connectivity predicts the distributions of tools. We, have, uh, we, have, we hope that we're gonna have more of this working coming soon. But if you are interested in this theoretical framework, we presented them recently in these two manuscripts, where we actually showed the influence, the potential influence of social networks on transmissions process. Just uh, as a summary, what you should know is that in archaeology, there are several hypotheses trying to explain, to ex explain the distributions of, uh, of uh, technological tools. But then this part of the social connectivity and social networks is actually are not yet in being investigated. So the third perspective then of this study is about including environmental factors into the, into the, into the scope of social transmissions in animal societies. So from January, I will start a postdoctoral position as Carson said, as I already fellow in France to investigate how environmental factors such as after fragmentation and social factors interact to influence the social transmissions in wild climates. Here I'm going to work with the two researchers from the MBA in the Institute in Aix-Marseille University, Cecilia Ben and Benoit So I hope to have more of that soon as well. And then what I hope today is that I, I, I hope I have called your attention to how variations in individual behavior can then lead to changes in the social structure. And uh, as I demonstrated to you, this can be represented throughout the network properties. I showed to you a 
fill up them, we have uh, we can estimate them through individual centralities, through the influence of individuals in the networks, or through how to be divided is the network. And this feedback loop may have influences on individual fitness, such as, well, individuals that better adjust their behavior to meet the challenge in social relationships, may, they may be better able to increase their own fitness. So the question is, how do individuals' behavior change to deal with these different pressures in the environment? For example, how they react to the pressures of information and pathogen transmissions, and how this affect back this feedback loop between social structures, so how social structure changes and how it affects social transmission. One may expect, for example, that individuals may increase the social distance and then would lead to a network that is more subdivided and therefore leading to social transmission. But does this refer to information pathogens together? How it differs? These are the questions that we're still looking for to be answered. So these are some of the evolutionary mechanisms of social transmissions within a holistic view and across the species. And I would like very much to thank you for your attention. Uh, this work has been conducted, most of these with Dr. Cedric Swear from the Center S in France and Dr. Andrew McIntosh from Kyoto University, and also the collaborations of other postdoctoral researchers such as Christian Pastoreta, Ivan Pulo Gonzalez, and Julie Dubosk, and many other researchers that have been uh, collaborating with me throughout the years. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Valeria. Um, great um, presentation with um, lots of data statistics, and then also showing how these um, approaches can be worked, um, uh, can be used in in for other questions or for other concepts going to 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 humans, and then the question of the change of social networks and social structure and fitness consequences. Um, yeah, very fascinating. Like always, you're welcome to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, then please type a question mark into the chat window, and I will then call you up. And whenever you're called up, please also quickly introduce yourself, say what's your name, where you're coming from, and what you study, so that we keep on knowing each other, even though maybe we know many people now that are regulars in the fine, but I also would especially invite the non-regulars and especially the, the young colleagues and, and, and PhD students and postdocs um, to contribute to the discussion. And um, the first um, question comes by Julia Fischer. Yeah, so my name is Julia Fischer. I'm at the German Climate Center in Göttingen and I study mostly wild baboons. And some of you maybe have been here when I talked about the guinea baboons. Thank you so much for this really wonderful presentation. I truly enjoyed it. Um, I have one question in your models. Um, in which way are you considering the way of transmission? Because we know at least from parasites, you know, some are transmitted via the soil and others, uh, uh, by body contact and are you thinking about this in your future work? Yeah, so um, in this um, theoretical uh, model we created for the what we call the optimal relationship model, we simply consider social interactions. So individuals, they are, let's say, free in the space mm -hmm. and when they interact, they, they decide whether they want to keep this interaction so they will maintain this, bring force or they will just uh, avoid those interactions. So we don't, we don't consider, let's say, the substrate, so we don't consider the soil yet, but for a future experiment uh, in the field, then I would like to look at endoparasites. We actually have done this um, with the Japanese macacus as well, with Andrew Macintosh, and um, we actually have a work being, that's, I hope we're going to be released this soon as well. So we look at these and endoparasites, the connections with social networks and so on. Okay. Because I think, I mean, from some of the papers I've seen, that's been a problem that some people are f not finding any correlation between parasite load and social interactions uh, scores, if you will. Um, and that's often because uh, it's uh, the way the, the parasites are transmitted or the pathogens are transmitted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true that it's quite a difficult to, to target in the field, but we do have some experiments already conducted, for example, with uh, E. coli, that they could create the genotypes so that it's, it's easy to, um, 
relatively <laughs> easy to, yeah. to get. But we also have some experiments conducted by our own research team on ectoparasites. So we could also show that and investigate the relationship between grooming and ectoparasite load. So it's a, it's a hard topic, but it's I think it's possible. It's, it's, it's on the way. <laughs> I am sure you will manage. I'm looking forward <laughs> to more of your work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we are moving to Argentina from Germany. Eduardo, please. Yes, good morning, Eduardo Fernandez, 2K Yale University, temporarily in nicer weather. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Valeria, for the wonderful presentation and, and quite, quite some outside my area of expertise. So I apologize if these are very, very basic questions. I have several. I'll start with one. Uh, if I get a chance, I'll, I'll ask the other ones. Uh, you studied you with us some analysis based on a set of 15 primate taxa. And, and that has been a little bit of a common theme across the fine seminar conversations and attention to how we're gonna use, if I followed it, I uh, just wanted you to comment, were these published data, where you're getting them from, and to what extent was the accessibility of data and the quality of data that you were accessing satisfying to our needs? Because that's has been a kind of a recurrent in fine listening to you. Some of us, about some data, I mean, like always, data come in all types and quality, and some of these repositories sometimes are maybe not mm -hmm. satisfying to some of us. So, so what was your experience? What kind of databases did you use? Can, can you share how was your experience tapping on available data somewhere yeah. in the cloud? Yeah, sure. Um, so in, in this case, I, I basically went to the literature and I started looking at um, the publications were using primate networks. So some of them, it's true, they were available, others were not. And what we did was then contacting directly the researchers and asking them whether they would like to, to share the publication that is available, whether they would like to, to be them in the, in the manuscript as co-authors. And it was a kind of a, a discussion in terms of uh, how far we, we should go. So it is true that I, I still think it is not so much, right? It's only 41 uh, primate networks. It's still a lot considered that we are, I mean, we are working with primates, so it's kind of a very difficult to collect this behavior data in the field. But then uh, my experience in terms of that was this. We already have this, somehow this, um, this we have these collaborations with the researchers working with primates, so we contacted them and we, we used what we could from this or we used what was available in the, in the literature. Thank you. I have a follow-up question on this one that is maybe rather, um, I don't know, primitive or, or stupid or inadequate. Um, the, of course, uh, the social network analysis, it only emerged more recently and there's more, there are more and more data collected. I think there was also some aims to have some like online databases where one can get all these kind of data. How do you see that this will evolve, let's say, in the next 10 years? Will we get more and more large databases with huge networks? Or is there something else coming, like a quality control? And we might say some networks are not worthwhile anymore. Or, or it's such a huge amount of data. Do you see a way that this will be organized for the scientific public in the community to, to use nicely? Or will, will something change? How data have to be collected and stored? Mm, I, I think what is what is happening is that we are more and more talking about open science. So I know that our some researchers in the United States don't remember exactly the university right now, sorry, but they are creating this um, um, database for networks, so animal animal social animal networks. So uh, there, I believe they have described it, for example, which is the type of interactions they collect, whether it's based on proximity, on affiliative uh, behaviors, on aggressive behaviors. Because this all changes according to the questions the researchers interested in building the networks, right? And then um, what I think uh, might change, or at, at least is, let's say, a hot topic or has been discussed a lot now in terms of social network analysis, is how to um, analyze, statistically analyze the data later in, within your uh, models. Right, so whether to apply new models or not. Uh, and then this is another discussion, but in terms of, let's say, the raw data, 
I think uh, we are moving in directions of having more and more publications that are open. So having this data available to the scientific community, and then um, that's at least what I, what I hope <laughs> will happen. Okay, thank you. Then there's a question in the chat from Ellen Herre. Um, um, I don't know. Can you, you can, can ask? Can you, you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yeah, you. Ah, okay. Um, following Julia's and then uh, your yours, Karsten's questions, uh, you have outlined really nicely how you have the potential and how some data support the idea that there is going to be feedback between interactions, information, all of these things. That, that's very exciting to me. You know, in some senses, it makes, well, in a lot of senses, it makes sense. My, my question follows the two questions or three questions you've just gotten, which is where do you predict uh, the organisms are going to be most likely to actually have some kind of adaptation or internal process to feed back and shift their um, shift their behavior. Uh, you know, if if all pathogens are everywhere, it almost doesn't make any difference. But where would you expect? Um, what types of ecologies would you expect this to be most um, frequent in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question and also a very complicated question because oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, because uh, the simple answer is that we expect this to vary a lot in terms mm -hmm. of uh, pathogens, in terms of the host. But then, for instance, what we... I will be serving that's what is important so much of field right biologists is that it's we already have evidence, for example, that in mandrus it looks like protozoas already drive somehow uh, variations, immediate variations, individual behavior. Um, I don't remember, uh, we have, for example, researchers working this kind of uh, evolution of this gas, showing that individuals, they, according to the smell, according to the taste, sometimes they avoid. So this is, this is very complicated to say um, which pathogens. I think this is going to be very specific. That's why when we created a theoretical model, it's very difficult to, to get a simple answer to sum up. What we, we do know is that there are some level of plasticity and individuals, they will behave um, trying to modulate the social interactions. To which pathogen? I cannot uh, precisely answer, give an answer, a broad answer, let's say. I think this would be really specific, species specific. So I could make some guess, for example, that um, pathogens that drive uh, clear uh, clinical signals, I think that would be a point I would start with. Um, but then it's, um, it's complicated to say I species and the pathogen specifically. I would rather actually look at my own spaces and say, okay, for my own spaces, what I think this could happen. So looking at that, that's what we are moving, for example, with the fruit flies experiments. We are making it very simple again. So we know that mm -hmm. information transmissions happens. We can control some parameters in these kinds of experiments. So um, for pathogens, we have already four bacteria that we already know that they have some effect in their behavior. So which one of these four bacteria can we choose? So you, you saw the results, even for fruit flies, it can be already complicated. <laughs> so we are just trying, we have some guess. We can say, okay, I think we can move on with uh, NP entomophila because it troubles the, the, the more drastic behavior uh, changes and then put this together with, uh, with uh, information transmission. But it is, I mean, it's, I, I, I cannot give you an answer, like a broad answer for always. No, no, I mean, it, yeah. But uh, both Julia and Kirsten were, uh, you know, you can be right, and yet the signal could be covered by yeah. many things. Yeah. I mean, I think you are right, but how you show that in a clear way. Yeah, um, yeah. And your way is now experiment. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. is, that is exactly where I would say I am right now. So we have evidences, independent evidences, right? That this is, this is the way, this is, that's something going on in this way. But then to prove this empirically, that is the mm -hmm. biggest questions right now. Yeah. So um, that's why we say carefully, it's like, it seems it's, it's in this direction. 
and uh, it looks like that uh, this feedback loop happens in this, in this way. For information transmissions that I said in my presentation is quite well, um, it's strong, right? We have a lot of evidence. For pathogen transmissions, at least for primates, it is starting right now. So I hope that in the future, we're gonna start having more and more work in saying that whether it's wrong or whether it's actually, this is, this is the, the good directions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Rosengaus. I'm working at Northeastern University in the United States. And my work uh, deals with um, termite social behavior and disease transmission. So Valeria, awesome, awesome presentation. And I would like to just, um, it's more of a comment, but I would like to see what you're thinking about regarding the fact that not all microbes are actually pathogenic mm -hmm. and that microbes are actually very important in helping the host. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, this is probably way another level of complexity that needs to be included into the network analysis and modularity and all the other items that you're measuring, because many of us have, you know, I would imagine all, my, all organisms, all hosts have actually struck important mutualistic interactions with our microbes? And how do we then include them as part of the analysis that you do? Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much for highlighting that because it's true that when we start talking about this trade-off between information and pathogens, we tend to, I mean, I tend to go for the negative, let's say, effects. But it's true that in terms of the microbiome transmissions, for example, we have already evidence that networks also influences and that's not something deleterious for the individual. But the only thing we can say, at least from these, is that it is to them that social connectivity mediates transmission. But doesn't mean that this is deleterious, it is entirely uh, negative for the individual. How to consider that in the models? I mean, my, my pragmatic answer would be consider the infection load. So there is a, somehow a, a point over there that if it is passed and then drivers individual seek, then you can say in the model, perhaps here, this is where it's uh, in the, the infection is clear. There's some individuals has clear uh, cell signals of being sick, and then this could drive um, uh, others to change. But then the question is becomes even more complex, complex. For example, we don't know yet much on how primates, talking about primates, how they identify other sick individuals, right? Is that in visually, and it's because of the smell, it's because of the, yeah. So this is, this is actually, uh, I, I would just say that um, this is actually a question for my long-term career. <laughs> so I hope that like in 10, 15 years, I, I'll give it a talk again and say, hey, this is that and then this, because uh, right now it's, uh, we have to perform a field experiments. It's easy to perform experiments with information, then experiments with transmissions, with pathogens, but then putting both together. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the complicated situation. But, it, but you're definitely right. So thank you for, for actually uh, highlighting that, yeah. Because it's also going to play a role in the transmission of the mutualists, right? If they're mm -hmm. mutualistic interactions, then that just adds another level of complexity to the system. Uh, yeah. Makes it even more interesting, but also more difficult to study. Mm -hmm. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you. So there's still ample time of questions and I would especially also invite our young colleagues to contribute. There's, there's no question at the moment. Okay, Eduardo has one, but I still take my priority to have a, a, a comment that comes out of my, my small brain after what um, Alan had mentioned. So it's less a question than a comment, but I mean, behind me, you see the succulent crew semi-desert where I work and always when students ask me, oh, it's Africa, what I need for protection against all these diseases, I tell them, look, it's an arid environment. It's, it's much safer than here in the middle of Europe. There are less pathogens because it's not so moist. And there has been also this theory, which we heard about, I think, in, in this and the last fine series, that in such dry, harsh environments, um, sociality, like cooperative breeding, especially evolved in both birds and mammals. And I was wondering whether living in such a relatively healthy environment where pathogens are not such a problem compared, let's say, to a tropical rainforest. It is also one reason why these high 
developed social societies can evolve because they don't have such high costs of potential pathogen transmission compared to moist environments. It might not only be an adaptation to the harshness, but also a reduced um, cost by pathogen transmission. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a valid hypothesis and we have to test. But um, I would say that to me, it's it's rather than one single factor, but it's 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 um, the multiplicity of these factors that affect how uh, the society evolves, right? So uh, yeah, I would say that uh, either because uh, of other factors in the system that drove those societies to behave in this way and then pathogen, they, they react to pathogens in a specific or other ways. But I, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, it's valid, but we have to look at the differences of factors together in this case, I think. Yes, of course. Then Eduardo, you have another question? I'll hold on to the question if there's a chance. What of a comment and, and really inviting you to see, uh, to, to extend what we're learning. Again, this is so outside my area of expertise. Uh, where are we? Uh, and I, I am not uh, imagining that this, this doesn't, what I'm gonna ask you to comment on is, you probably have read more than I have on this. Where are we in understanding how humans communicate about disease? I mean, I'm thinking about the COVID and I'm taking it to an extreme thanks to culture. Now, in a way, masks are telling us something about people. But but before that, it could be a running nose. You, you talk to somebody somebody on the phone and you say, well, you sound like you have a cold, et cetera. But, but where are we? Have we gone any further? I'm sure we have in, in understanding how humans can read from us something about our level of infection or, or et cetera, or our health inside that may not be showing too obviously, is there are there olfactory, olfactory cues? Uh, do do I mean do you know anything about that? I mean, chit chatting. This is the nice thing about this hour. Where and if you don't know, maybe somebody else will in the audience. I was just curious. Uh, for humans, um, well, I think to us, what really helps is that we can talk right about what we are feeling. So <laughs> I think, uh, well. Yeah, so I would say that, um, for example, information is much easily transmitted, I think, among uh, human societies, right? For example, like right now we have the social networks. So when we have, a, considering, considering good information, and then this can be re easily reachable through cell phones, through social networks, through two televisions. So I think uh, that for humans is simply the, the questions of the communications that is so well established and uh, the information can be can reach so many people at the same time so in terms of uh, signs of infection I, I i confess i never really thought about that because we usually we talk right when we're feeling sick or it also depends on the societies because right now with the covid situation we are using more um um, masks, but for example, in Japan, they already had this behavior before. So they use masks when they feel sick. So somehow they they have self isolate, right? So um, yeah, I don't know. I have to put more thought on that. But I think uh, but, communication. But even, I mean, we we know that there are sexually dimorphic traits in humans, and that's even when we can talk. I mean, I could, I could go and say I'm a male. Still, we have. What I'm saying is that there could be reasons why. In human communication, uh, we may be picking up on cues that are, that that the individual cannot hide, so to speak, but may be interest to others of knowing that this is a, this is somebody with a way, way too way too much of a load of whatever pathogen, right? I mean, and we do some of that. I mean, yeah. you, you notice people he looked he looked sick, right? So that's <laughs> saying that, but but that's. My impression is very informal. I was wondering if we have gone further in analyzing changes in the tone of our voice or, or, or I, of olfaction. Yeah, I, I actually I don't know. I don't know if the researchers have actually looked at this kind of uh, details for mm. humans. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Thanks. But it's yeah, but it's true that I mean we we have this behavior towards ourselves, right? If you look at someone that is sick, we say this person looks sick, and then we, depending on who it is, we avoid having interaction. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> no, no, they, they, they're depending who is. That's yeah. crucial, right? But then you yeah. can start think, imagining keen selection effects of, okay, I can tolerate this kind of cold in my son, <laughs> but not on someone else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, okay. And we have a question by Susan Perry. Hello, thanks for a nice talk. This is really interesting stuff. I was just wondering a little more about the details of the social network um, methodologies you're using with your empirical data sets. I have a um, long-term data set that I've been collecting with the aim of studying cultural transmission. And one of the questions that are the problems I'm really trying to tackle at the moment is to isolate what aspects of particular relationships, but also of individual demonstrators and individual learners, you know, using this hind framework will predict whether or not they adopt particular things or at least conform to one of two or more um, options for, for dealing with a particular situation. <coughs> and um, so every few years I dip into the social network methods literature and see if there's a, the perfect method for me yet. And so far I can't seem to quite find it. Um, some of the, so I'm, I'm interested in, again in, in isolating, you know, you've got an individual who's doing behavior X and it's a rare behavior. You want to be able to say, who did he get this from with some degree of probability, right? And so, so you look at all of the different potential models and what they're doing at that particular point in time. And what is the association they have with that one? And what's the quality of the relationship it has with all of these different options of, of models they might've learned it from. And, um, so you, you, you could chunk the data into different time periods or various ways I can conceive of doing it. But what do you think would be the best approach of the social network techniques that are available at the moment that would also take into account, hopefully, the uncertainty in the measures? For example, in my case, I'm collecting data on a bunch of different groups. And so there are, there are chunks of time missing. And so obviously none of our um, first adoption times are perfect. Um, we also may have little gaps in our assessment of the quality of social relationships because we're not there with every group every day. Um, so I've found that it's incredibly challenging to find uh, a social network technique that takes into account you know, the, the time, the different points in time, and also the uncertainty, important uncertainty in, in different uh, uh, um, variables that I'm trying to measure. Are you, mm -hmm. or could you direct me towards some great methods papers that deal with this? Or, or maybe it'll be like last week where you'll say, well, hasn't been invented yet, <laughs> but maybe <laughs> soon. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it's a quite complete question because I think you were talking since, the, since before how to deal with your data, how to build the networks, and then how to analyze the so cultural transmissions in, in, let's say, across your, 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 your nodes. So mm -hmm. the first thing is that um, to build your network. So it really depends... On your question so what i would do is that first looking at the different levels of uh, of um, different types of behaviors we have so either for example affiliative aggressive so it really depends on let's say on the species but then have this exploratory view on whether for example i don't know for some uh, reason you may assume that affiliative behavior is more important because individuals they have such a rate of interactions throughout the day for example and then you build them let's say upon on that then well, th this, this is just I mean, this is just a, a like a very <laughs> rough uh, explanation, right? I mean that part I think I have more or less figured out. I've been working with these animals for a long time. I mean I I would construct a relationship quality index that basically is the probability that something affiliative versus something not so nice is going to happen in in the next interaction. So using the past maybe year or so of interactions, yeah. just sort of a measure of tolerance. So I could use that, or else I could use if I have enough food, you know, food related information, see what's the chance that they're going to push someone away from their food versus let them stay and watch. Yeah. So one of those two measures I'd use for that, but then also just total time and association matters because they could have, you know, a, a nice relationship, but not see each other that much, in which case probably transmission isn't going to happen for a complex technique. Yeah. So then this is the point. I think uh, what I would do first is trying to understand which is the the, I would say the importance of these relationships for, for the individuals in general, right? And then moving to this part where there, that is that cultural transmissions depend on these relationships or not. But then, for example, what you're saying to me is that you are also worried about the, the amount of data you have. So there are some uh, researchers working on these, either uh, from the group in Constance and also from the group in Exeter. 
And what they do is that, uh, for example, you might know Damian Farina and also mm -hmm. yeah, Michael. Okay. Um, I will write his surname over here because um, I might uh, say it wrong. I think it's Vaz. I don't know. It's over there. It's also okay. from the Exeter University. So they are looking at this kind of methodologies for looking at when you have incomplete data, how should you do, how can you, you confirm, for example, that your networks are robust enough to perform analysis you wanted to do. And then after that, when you have a, I mean, I'm being very simplistic. So we, in another day, if you wanted to discuss with me, for example, by Skype over Skype another day, we can just set a meeting. But then the other part, let's say on the cultural transmission side of the story, then it depends on the model you, you can apply. For example, if you have the time of acquisitions or if you have the time of innovations of, um, I mean, it depends on the resolutions of the data we have, you can move for these network-based diffusion analysis, right? So you, you might, have you heard about them as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, I've been reading about those. And the problem I have is that they don't seem to have a great measure, of, a way of um, weighting the data points according to uncertainty because, you know, there are gaps. And so the, how certain I am about the, the time when it diffused, when the, when it diffused is, is worrying yeah. me with so, that. So I believe that, uh, that it was a paper published by, um, again, I would write it here because I'm afraid of saying the name is wrong. I think it's Sonia Wired and um, William Hoppet. It was published, I think last year in, um, in primates, in journal primates, okay. where they're talking about uncertainty, if I'm not wrong. This I can send to you later as well, if you wanted to send me your email or something, or I can look for your email. Because I think if I'm not wrong, they use, they implement the network-based diffusion analysis considering these uncertainty levels. So you oh, can actually okay. first run this kind of analysis, making sure that how your networks work, and then you say, okay, can I move on? <laughs> or how that far sounds, can I go? <laughs> that sounds perfect. I had missed yeah. that paper. And that sounds uh, like it I, is- I, I, I believe, if I'm not wrong, I believe they, what is what they did. So we can, um, yeah, we can see mm -hmm. about that, yeah. Great, thank you. That's You're welcome. very useful. And we have a question by Adriana. Hi, Valeria. Thanks for Hello. your nice talk. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm Adriana Maldonado Chaparro from Universidad de Rosario in Colombia. Uh, my question is maybe I missed it uh, somehow in your presentation, but when you were showing this model where you have disease of trans uh, I'm sorry, transmission um, and then the clustering after and before the behavior changes. So with behavioral changes, then you get a different or a more clustered network, right? I was wondering, what are the edges representing in these networks? Is it uh, a realized transmission of the disease or is it interactions among individuals or you are talking about sure. my, my theoretical models, right? And yes. So in the theoretical models, this represents the social interactions among individuals. So the host. Yeah, yeah. So home. here, um, and then, but basically, is it just one? So you're diffusing the disease within the interactions of the, of the host. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's start back. In this, if it's a theoretical model, right, where we have information, pathogen transmissions together, but it's okay. So what happens there is that social diffusion doesn't happen. We, we don't model diffusion there in that theoretical model. What we do is that we say that our individuals with different values of information and pathogens, so costs and benefits, and they have to react as they wish. They have to form the relationships as they wish according to the potential costs and the potential benefits they will get. So that's why at the end, what we observe in the social network is the links represents these social relationships, how much interactive they interact with each other depending on the causes. So basically what they did, let's suppose it's the first step. I am in the network, I'm in the group. Then I go and meet you and say, oh, uh, okay, I think I'm gonna be her friend. I go back and I look at someone else and say, no, no, it's not so much. And then I started connecting with you. Because for some reason, let's say we have some information that I, is important to me, so I keep it going with you. So let's say the second step would be that whether actually information or pathogen transmissions would happen and how this would um, um, happen in the, in the network per se. So then uh, this step we didn't look yet. We just interested by the first, uh, let's say, um, time, time point. Like if an individual they have costs and benefits, how they do interact, how they form relationships. 
Okay. Okay. And then how do they get sick? So how is the disease transmitted within this network? So in this theoretical framework, we still don't put transmissions. That's what, what I'm saying. Okay. Like, in, you so understand? It's, it's, it's just in questions of um, with who am I going to interact and how strong am I going to interact with those individuals. So and what are the cost? Sorry. The cost is, yeah, no, no problem. The cost is, is that this individual might be very well sick or not, and then they decide whether to avoid this individual or not. So this is just the first, let's say, the first window. It, not, it doesn't mean that when they interact, they will get sick. They just perceive that there is a risk there, so they say, okay, I'll get away. So what is missing is actually the second step, considering the model that they would get sick. And then if they get sick, how the own behavior changes. But then mm -hmm. this increases too much the complexity of the model because right now, for example, it's already complicated to understand the networks that emerge. So what we can say, for example, right now is that we can take a few conditions of this theoretical model and then say, based on these networks that those individuals are infected, those are informed, how does information is spread and how individuals would react to our disease? Then it would be another question. Okay, I see. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, welcome. So the next question comes by Baptiste. Good evening, uh, Manaya. Thank you very much for uh, your talk. Um, you refer to uh, Charlie's Nunn's um, work and, of course, some of his uh, early uh, work looking at the relationship between group size and parasitism, especially in primates. And so he was really at this kind of high level of interaction between sociality and, and diseases. And I'm sure you already know uh, all of his uh, kind of results in much more detail than I do, but basically it feels like he was a bit showing that it's not as simple and we cannot find a strong relationship between group size and transmission or things like this. And then it feels like your work is going at like a finer level, like maybe looking at dynamics within a group because it seems like those group size characteristics are too fixed and transmission cannot really act at this level. Um, but even within this, we know that, for example, the effect of modularity is going to completely weaken if the uh, transmissibility or the, yeah, the transmissibility is very high, uh, maybe like Springer uh, work on Lemur or things like this. And, and now, what you were showing with those uh, flies experiment are like super exciting that they just don't behave like anyone would expect. And you are suggesting that maybe even their genetic background or uh, maybe pre-exposure, actually this is not something you, you mentioned, but I would be super interesting to have your opinion on past history of infection. Um, and so to me, I'm a bit left with, well, what, at which level do we really expect that the system is not so complex that evolution does not manage to fix anything? Do you see what I mean? It feels like in the end, the only real uh, thing that is very well um, pinpointed by your uh, models and previous work is that there is some form of reaction to a disease. Maybe some of the changes in the network are actually a mix of a response to limit infection and maybe a incapacity to carry on with interactions because of the disease itself. But I'm a bit like, yeah, left. Um, do you think it's a very strong, maybe if I try to summarize, sorry. Do you think it's a strong enough pressure that it can compete with predation or information sharing like you nicely uh, presented today? Um, or do you think basically the only thing that individual can do is to the margin adapt a bit their clustering, the modularity for a few weeks, but we won't catch this at a phylogenetic level, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very important question because it's um, something that we have been thinking a lot recently. And especially because when we look at these, um, this is study, for example, that I have a difference with primary species. We guess that there are some already some differences for within primates. So uh, my quick answer to you would be that um, pathogen to me, but it's that's very um, in my opinion, it's like personal. Let's say it's not based on you know, evidence. That's what I would guess. Is that uh, alone? It's not the strongest pressure 
to drive any changes in the social behavior. To me, it should be more like you said, something like that is punctual. So individuals, they basically, they react at some cost. And then together with other pressures, they would say, okay, now we have to, to do this in terms of uh, whatever. You know, so that is my, my, my guess, but I cannot give you like a definitive answer that that is correct for one. This is, this is on the discussions. This is some, a topic actually to, to be investigated. Yeah, that's, that's what I would, I would say. And then my guess as well is that there are already should have some differences within species. We saw that, for example, to Cebus, they become much more uh, modular. Actually, the networks are much more modular than the other, net or the other primate networks. So we, get, we guess why why they, they show that. But again, um, we only have, uh, for example, from samples, we had only five, four uh, primate networks. So it is still not so much to say that in, in this level. So this is actually a complicated question, right? And then my, my guess is just that, that actually this is a punctual um, behavioral response and then to really drive into something, then it should be a, a combined uh, pressure among other social environmental factors. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great talk, super interesting. Then we have a follow up question by Alan, sorry, Alan Herrera on um, a question that Rebecca had. Okay, just the comment that she had about there being mutualists being important as well as pathogens, absolutely correct. There will be some kind of net effect of mutualist plus pathogens, which is, I think, what you can measure. But I, it struck me as I've heard these last several people talking with you and you responding that, um, just to put it in a metaphor, tropical forests think you're right, or your basic points are correct, because you are looking at social interactions tensions, whether they're tight or not, you can see with plants, whether they're diverse, whether they're tightly spaced, you can see all of these things. They don't move the way, you know, the animals do, but what they do show very clearly is if the disease that hits them, the net effect is bad, they are well spaced, they are rare. If it is not bad, they are close together. And it is, in one sense, a disease that's caught, the, the strength of the disease is causing the mm -hmm. spacing. And so uh, it just struck me during the course of all of the different interesting discussions you guys have had that extremely different systems are suggesting very much that the same types of factors are at play. So. Tropical forests endorse your scientific enterprise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have a question by David Wood. Hi, thanks for such an interesting talk. It's been great to, to hear so many talks about social network analysis. So it's a very, very cool tool. Um, I'm David, I'm a third year graduate student at Yale working with Eduardo Fernandez Duque. Uh, and I'm curious about what role like spatial distance could play in, in your models, because I would think at least thinking in terms of, of primates, like the two most important pieces of information that they could maybe have is, is there a predator nearby and where can I go to eat? And both of those can be communicated vocally. Um, and as long as you're like in, in line of sight and hearing them, then you could gather that information and then potentially still have enough distance to avoid uh, getting infected by, by any sort of pathogen. So uh, the answer is in the theoretical model, uh, this only information that can be transmitted through social context. So they have to get into contact, that's all. So again, this is a simplistic model because this is the first step. So we just say they have to get in contact to, 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 get, to get some, to perceive information and to perceive pathogens. And that's, that's all. So the spatial distance here doesn't play a role but again, this is very important to look at the field and then think this again, this, this is species specific. Because for example, we may expect that in a group of Japanese macaques where the social relationships are based on, is influenced by the social hierarchy, they would have no much choice. I mean, individuals, they have males, uh, mothers and the kids, they, they are in the high rank, they'll be all together. That's important for many other mechanisms in the group. So we might expect that that would be a very strong hub 
But then they also hold the most important information, right? Because they choose where they're going to forage and they have a better access to the, to the best uh, foraging sites. So then how it affects the more peripheral individuals that actually don't interact so much, they are in the periphery, but they also cannot access information. So uh, that's why in this model, we consider that this would not be uh, important at this first level. And then we just say socially acquired and that's it. They have to get into contact yeah, to perceive it because I think that was uh, what I was missing perhaps in the presentation. I think I have to, to, to refrain to that it is perceived. They don't get information, they perceive information and they perceive pathogens and they decide what to do. Yeah. Thanks. So that was the last question. Thank you to everyone for a lively discussion. And thanks a lot for Valeria for a fascinating um, talk with so many um, different topics. Um, one more round of applause. And um, I would also like to use this opportunity to um, thank actually all the speakers of this um, season of fine that we had in fall that we gave a fantastic talks. It was really fascinating. Um, for me and I think for, for many or most of us and would like to look forward to, um, where is it here, the season that is coming up starting the 1st of March, the program, the preliminary program is online on YouTube and of course we will in time send around the final program so that everybody is informed and with this we as all the fine organizers are very much looking forward to meet all of you guys again um, next year 